Hey guys, Mr. Bowman here. Today's learning objective is up the top, and we are learning to identify the key features, assumptions, and formula of a Poisson distribution. And this is a brand new type of distribution that we're looking at, and it will be the first time. So, a the idea of a Poisson distribution it refers to the number of occurrences of a given event in a given unit. So I'm just going to underline given event and given unit because those are really key parts or key concepts to understand what a binomial distribution does. So the idea of a given event could be anything. It could be um, the number of cars driving by. It could be the number of dandelions in the grass patch. And it could be the number of chocolate chips in a cookie. So that's the idea of a given event, the number of something's coming up. And what adds to that is the idea of a given unit. And the unit refers to something else. So it could be per period of time. So when we're talking about cars driving by, it could be cars driving by per hour, per day. It could be per area of land. So when you're talking about the number of dandelions in the grass, it could be per meter squared. And the last one, we talked about the number of chocolate chips. That could be per cookie. So the idea is we are looking for some kind of event, and it's related to some kind of interval or unit. Could be time, could be area, it could be a specific thing. So we've got up there our learning objective. Down the bottom, we've got our definition and some examples of units. Let's change pink color, let's get into yellow, and let's run through the assumptions. Oh, apologies, that didn't end up changing, but we're gonna look at the assumptions of a Poisson distribution. Assumptions. So number one, there are five again, you must be referring to discrete variables. So for example, we looked at the number of cars going by on the motorway, you can't have part of a car. You, we talked about the number of dandelions in that patch of grass, and we can't have a patch of, or part of a dandelion. We either have one or we don't, or we have a car and we don't. Number two, the second assumption, the events, they must be independent of each other. So the idea of the presence of one dandelion, that somehow doesn't mean there's going to be other dandelions, or it doesn't affect other dandelions going by, or the fact that that red Ford drove by, that's not going to make other cars drive by as well. Okay, the third assumption, the events cannot occur simultaneously, cannot occur simultaneously. So the idea is um, when those cars are driving by, we're never going to have two cars kind of in the same space. The cars are always going to be separate and distinct, and they're two different um, cars. And if you look at the dandelions and the grass, well, the dandelions are never the same thing. There's never two dandelions growing on top of each other. It's the same dandelion or it's a different dandelion. Maybe it's two dandelions right next to each other, but they are not occurring at the same time or they don't grow simultaneously. The fourth one, they must be random or unpredictable. So there mustn't be a pattern that underline that underlies the occurrence of these events. And the, the last one, number five, this is the important one. The probability must be proportional to the size of the interval. And what that means is if your interval was larger, we should expect more of these occurrences to occur. So if you're staring at the motorway, staring out the window, you're staring for 10 minutes, maybe you expect 100 cars to go by. If you're staring for an hour, you would expect a lot more cars to drive by. And that's the idea that the number of events is going to be proportional to the unit we're looking at. If we're looking at two cookies, we're probably going to expect more chocolate chips in those two cookies than that one cookie. If you're looking at a small garden, you're probably going to expect less dandelions in that small garden than maybe the neighbor's bigger garden.
And that is a quick summary of the five assumptions of a Poisson distribution. I'm now going to change colors. We're into the blue pen. And I'm going to write down the formula of a Poisson distribution. So it does look messy, but I do want to emphasize the components are relatively easy to understand. And if you know how to use your graphics calculator, it will actually do most of the work for you. So the first variable I want us to look at is that lambda that funny looking h just up there so it does pop up twice and that lambda that refers to the mean or the average of our data so for example cars driving by you would typically expect an average per hour you'd be able to calculate it number of chocolate chips in a cookie you'd be able to find an average that represents that the next one we want to look at is we can see that little x comes up three times. And that relates to the number of occurrences that you're interested in. Number of occurrences interested in. So for example, if you're wondering how many chocolate chips are in that cookie, you're wondering what's the probability that there's going to be exactly four chocolate chips in that cookie, the X would be four, because you're interested in how many times does four chocolate chips pop up. The big X, just underlining there, that relates to the just the generic variable itself, um, the number of cookies or the number of cars or the number of dandelions. The next one that I want to focus on, um, two last ones, we'll finish off them in white. So the idea of this E, so the E, it looks like a variable, but that's similar to pi. It's actually just the number, 2.71828, and that goes on for a little bit. And the calculator has that for you, so that's nothing to worry about. And the last bit is that X explanation mark. That means it's a factorial, which is does represent a maths symbol so for example four explanation mark what we're actually going to do is we're going to start at four then the next one three then the next one two then the next one one and we can come up with that answer so that looks like that's going to be 624 and if we were doing five factorial well we'll be adding in a five so five times four times three times two times one and that will get us to 120 and I do want to emphasize, do not worry about the formula too much because we will have help with our calculators. And they do an amazing job. And we will be using them heavily to do that. All right, so I'm not going to worry about that. So let's finish up for today. We've recapped. We've got our, our up the top there, our learning objective. We've got kind of our definition or summary of a percent distribution. On the right, we've got all of our assumptions. And in the middle, I've got a little overview of the formula, but I do want to note, I haven't spelled it out properly, but the calculators are of a big use for us with percent distributions. So hopefully you found this video useful. Now let's start thinking about the numbers and how we can actually calculate the probability of given events using a percent distribution.